Hey everybody, this is Tim Ash, President of the Vermont State Senate, here with my daily update on Vermont's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is Thursday, May 21st. We're in about the ninth week of this uh, COVID normal or abnormal, whatever we want to say about it. And I'm really delighted that today we'll be talking one of, with one of Vermont's most important business leaders, Donna Carpenter from Burton Snowboards. And well, Burton, I yell that, I, won't, I don't want to get the title wrong, but Burton, we all know who you are and what you guys are about. And really want to focus today on a discussion about how one of our most prominent companies, one of our most important employers, has been handling this whole disruption that COVID has created. So Donna, thank you so much for, for joining me. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So Donna, one of the things that every Vermonter has experienced slightly differently was an awakening to the fact that COVID was, a, was going to impact us, whether it was in our personal lives or our uh, business lives where we work. And Burton, I'm sure, was, not a, uh, was no exception to that. At what point did you guys know that COVID, when it was overseas and starting to make its way to the U.S., at what point did you realize that Burton was going to be impacted? What was the triggering moment for you? You know, really for me personally, Tim, it was March 13th when we had spearheaded and organized but had the support of the whole industry to do a global ride for Jake Day in memorandum of, of my husband, late husband who passed in November. Um, and it was really quite amazing. There were resorts all over the world offering free lift tickets to snowboarders to come and pay tribute. So a lot of people were out that day. And that really was, I think, the last day that any resort in the world was open. And we quickly, I believe it was either Monday or Tuesday of that following week, we closed all global retail and all global offices. Well, that March 13th, I think, was also the day that we declared a state of emergency in Vermont. Uh, it was also the day we voted to close down the State House for safety concerns uh, along the same lines. What were the kind of the, other than shutting down your retail and, and uh, other operations at that point, what, what were some of the immediate steps you had to take? Uh, you know, Burton's not a company that can easily and lightly just shut down operations. So what were some of the first steps you had to take to, to transition? No, but we're pretty agile, Tim, because we've been through some crises. I would say this isn't our first rodeo. Maybe what makes it unique this time is that it is truly worldwide. But we are used to recessions, global economic crises, tsunamis in Japan, um, bad disastrous winters. So we knew what, you know, we knew, I don't want to say we had a playbook for this. Um, the good news is we were coming off of a really good year and we are in very good shape financially, probably the best we've ever been. We don't have any investors. We don't have any long-term debt. We are very close to not needing short-term borrowing. So we, uh, we're in good shape, but obviously like other companies, we had to act quickly. So the first thing we really did was we cut all salaries. Uh, it was a sliding scale. Anybody making under 60,000 did not get a pay cut. And then it went up to the CEOs taking, a, I believe, 50%. Uh, my family and I are taking a 100% salary bonus distribution cut. We're fortunate. A lot of time, founders are dependent on their company for income, and we're not. And this is something we also did during the economic crisis in 2008, 2009, to help the company get through it. Uh, you know, we paid our retail workers through mid-April, even though we had shut down uh, in March. I have to tell you, there is a huge difference between how this was handled in the U.S. 
and how this was handled in were, other parts of the world. Yeah, in, what were some of the differences? Yeah, in our in our European offices, our headquarters, we, we have a substantial office in Innsbruck, Austria, and then we have offices in Munich, Germany, and, and Zurich. And the government simply kept everyone on payroll and funneled, we told them, we gave them the list of the workers that were in, involved in sales, basically, right? Anybody involved in either wholesale sales or our own retail sales uh, or e-commerce sales, we, you know, had to immediately furlough and they just funneled us the money uh, between 80 and 95% of the person's salary uh, immediately. We never took them off payroll. So to see, you know, they have a social safety net and nobody's worried about health care or paying for COBRA or, you know, so to, to see that difference has been quite stark. Yeah, as a state, we face a similar challenge. I mean, we watch Congress right now. There are actually people in both parties in Washington, amazingly, talking about income replacement through the federal government the way you've just described. The likelihood that it passes anytime soon with the political culture we have, probably pretty low. But from the Well, I'm hoping so. You know, our Senator Bernie Sanders, he would get criticized by the other side by talking about uh, this social safety net, everybody having health care, everybody having paid sick leave, everybody having a paid family leave as communist. Or something. Right. Well, I, <laughs> and you I, go, no, it actually works in a, in a time of crisis. No, I, I trust me, when I worked for him for three years, I was on the receiving end of those claims over and over. But I think People, when they think of Austria as an example, they don't think of that as a weakling economy that doesn't have a lot of sophistication and a very strong uh, private sector. I mean, it really is. No, and they're coming out of it, uh, their time frame, they are ahead of us. So we are really using them to uh, work on best practices for here because they opened up retail a couple of weeks ago. They've slowly opening up the office so we can really find out what they're doing right. And well, focusing on the Vermont operations for Burton, um, you have people who do design here. You have some manufacturing. What were, some, what were the things that people were allowed to continue to do in Burton facilities? What were the things that people had to do remotely? And is there anything that was no longer able to be done as a result of the stay-at-home order more generally? Oh, yeah. I mean, we really shut down worldwide and told everybody to stay home at that point, even if they couldn't do their work from home, right? Um, we did keep our manufacturing facility open, or we reopened it a couple weeks later to make uh, protective equipment for healthcare workers. So we were able to reopen that safely as well as we were doing some shipping of other protective medical stuff to, with the help of the state of Vermont. So we had a warehouse, for example, open and doing shipping. Otherwise, everything else closed down. Uh, I think it's this week, Tim, maybe you can tell me, we're, we're slowly reopening so that people who haven't been able to do their job from home uh, for example, warranty or our photo studio, uh, you know, obviously retail workers, uh, that they can come back in a safe way. And, and we're going to be really, really strict about hand washing, masks, and social distancing. So, yeah, and that's, I mean, one of the things that I th uh, is such a challenge with a public health crisis like this is we want to make sure we ease back into it safely so we don't have to shut down again, which would be just absolutely a huge. I mean, it's bad enough economically right now, but if we have to do it again, it's a real, it would be a real pile driver. In terms of, terms of the protective equipment, both the manufacturing and also um, distributing, how, how, did, how did you come to find yourselves making that pivot after a couple of weeks? What, how did that get initiated? 
where did the equipment go? Why did it go to the people who received it? It's interesting. I was thinking about it, and I was thinking it struck. It, it's a lot like Burton itself. It started as a small idea and grew up, it grew into something much bigger than I could have even imagined. It literally started when I was talking to a board member, and she was saying that, you know, it was right, you know, towards the end of March, I guess mid mid to late March when we were really looking at those shortages of protective equipment and the federal government really didn't have their act together. And this board member, we were talking about various things and she said, hey, I saw that, you know, General Mass, Mass General in Boston is asking anybody with a 3D printer if they can print these K and 95 masks. <clears throat> they had the formula online and so forth. So I thought, you know, yeah, we've got um we've got three 3D printers. We could totally look into that. And by the end of the day, my senior VP of global product came back and said, you know, I just talked to our largest binding supplier in the world, a company called Fudiken in China. And they said that there's less and less demand for these masks in China, obviously. And one of their best friends owns this factory that is all geared up and ready to go on these masks. And I said, how much can they guarantee? And they said, you know, a capacity between 300 and 500,000 in two to three weeks. So, and they said, you have to lock in the price now. These masks normally cost 60 cents. They, uh, we paid a dollar 20. And they said, if you don't lock in the, do uh, the order now, it's going to a dollar eighty because Australia just came in with an order, so we were competing. So that I mean, it's just an insane thing. Sure. But I thought, hey, if we could use our supply chain, because we have a, a large office there of people who do nothing but check quantity, quality. So it's not like you can just call a factory. We had people. We had to get it approved by basically the, you know, the health department here in Vermont. There's a great story. My lead product guy on this was passing off samples to Governor Scott's chief of staff in the park and ride in Waterbury. He said it probably looked like a really sketchy drug deal, but he's giving him a sample of an actual mask so that they can run the specs. And we had everybody say, yes, this is what we need. This is the right thing. Go ahead. And then you have to say, oh, can they really make half a million masks in two weeks? Are they lying about that? So you have people who go in and they make sure that they don't change the quality in the middle. So, you know, it's, it's you know, like I said, it's not like you just call up a factory and say, hey, I want to place an order. We really have to manage the production process as well as the shipping, which was a whole nother nightmare. But I'm incredibly proud of my team. And then we converted the 3D printers here in Burlington, we worked with Boston Children's Hospital to design and spec out a face shield that the, the plastic face shield that the healthcare workers wear. And we are producing for them as well as uh, UVM and I believe Dartmouth. And we're producing approximately 500 a week, uh, and we're making thousands of the parts that they need for it at the same time, so. That's a pretty amazing uh, turn of events, and I do love the sort of modern marvel of a supply chain that starts in a remote province of China and ends up at a park and ride in Waterbury. There's something kind of magical about how, how quickly things can, 
get from point A to point B in this modern age. Well, and we also, we've been talking about what we hope comes out of this, and I hope that there is, um, uh, people face reality, whether they like it or not, the world is globalized. We are never going, ever going back to the day where a country can produce everything that they need within their borders. I couldn't produce outerwear in this country if I wanted to. You know, there are no more factories that do that. And it would be cost ineffective for me to duplicate a supply chain that's already there. So I think we have to embrace, yeah, we're global. So instead of focusing on building walls, how do we build relationships so that, hey, we make this that you need and you make this that we need right. and um, we can all work together. I mean, you know, for example, my, you know, we only have less than 20% of our product comes from China, but our um, Chinese partners there are unbelievably honest and hardworking and fair to their labor. You know, we, we, we are part of the Fair Labor Association, which is the highest standard from the UN. So we know we're working with decent uh, employers. So we're going, we need China. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, yeah, well, I, I commend you in terms of showing the initiative to help meet the needs for all these healthcare facilities. I know that- You know, Tim, for me, it was really personal. Uh, in 2000, Jake passed last year, 2019. In 2015, he had a rare immune disorder called Miller-Fisher syndrome, and he spent eight weeks, in eight weeks, two months in the ICU at Dartmouth. And I saw on a daily basis these people who work in those ICUs, the doctors, the nurses, the respiratory therapists. You know, he was on a breathing machine for three months. Mm. Um, and then he, you know, received cancer care from, from UVM and end of life care. And I, I just remember how compassionate they, they all were. And we were able to spend his last couple of days with him in the hospital as a family. I think about those people now that are losing people that can't go visit their loved ones. But I, I really, it, it hit me hard from, I guess, a personal perspective of what those people, it's hard to describe the gratitude that you have for those people who saved your husband's life in such a beautiful, graceful way. Well, it's a pretty remarkable way to pay it forward. If, um, if you yeah, so we really, and the st I have to say, the state of Vermont was really terrific to work with. It made me appreciate Vermont even more. We, uh, you know, it was actually the governor's chief of staff reached out to me just to say, hey, uh, how are you guys doing? And I said, you know, I just ordered these masks. <laughs> and he said, do you know what you're going to do with them? And I said, no, I don't. And could you distribute it? Could you, you know, could you prioritize Vermont and New Hampshire as well as New York, where Jake and I both grew up in New York City, and um, Boston, which, you know, where, we, where he also received treatment. So, you know, they did a terrific job of, of doing that and prioritizing and making it easy. And yeah, well, so it's great. It's great to hear. I mean, I've been watching, you know, I've been behind the scenes seeing how been trying to solve a hundred problems all at once every single day. And so I know, e each, I each, each time there's a solution to a shortage or a problem like this, I think it's, it would, it would be a standout moment, you know, uh, over the course of many months. And we've had to uh, rely on the kind of partnerships that you've just described to make lots of good things happen in what seems like an eternity, but it's only been nine weeks. That's what's so amazing about, you know, it's really not just a cheesy slogan. Vermont has community. 
and they really do step up. And every time anything happens from Hurricane Irene to this, you just become even prouder to be a Vermonter. No, it's been a good good reminder of what's so good about it. Can you talk? Can you talk a little bit about what what it's been like morale wise for your staff? You've had some, you know, the ones who are making uh, the shields and the masks. I'm guessing had a slightly different experience than the people who were who were at home and not able to do their normal work. How how is it weighed on uh, the Vermont employees you have? Yeah, I would say, you know, we were able to retain most of our workforce except really, again, for sales, retail sales, you know, although we kept on store management, you know, most retail uh, employees and anybody involved in, in wholesale sales. Uh, but, you know, like I said, then we were able to really pivot product towards um doing that and a lot of people are working from home around around the world and it's also it's almost making us having having to be more transparent with our workforce and communicate better we're having a lot of these zoom company meetings uh regionally as well as globally we're having uh zoom you know, ask the senior management question, kind of global town halls, things that we wouldn't have necessarily done that we feel that we have to do. We have one senior manager, uh, global senior manager, send out an update every day about their area. So it's making us, uh, you know, realize how important communication and transparency. I mean, I would, you asked about morale, it's it's interesting because we survey both our employees and our customers twice a week and we're a global company and what we see are the employees and customers in Europe are the most optimistic the employees and customers in Japan are by far the least optimistic and and the US is kind of in between so I would say people are anxiously optimistic I also think that uh, you know we know there's going to be short-term pain for everybody and we're trying to share that burden but long term I think there will be pent-up demand for snowboarding for the mountain lifestyle and getting outdoors and for Burton. So it's nice to be able to reassure an organization that, hey, coming out of this, we're going to be as relevant as ever. Well, that's great. I think one of the one of the challenges for everybody in leadership positions right now is to both be realistic about the challenges we confront, face the facts, but also uh, be encouraging about when we get to the other side of this so that people have the kind of optimism that requires, you know, you really need that dose of optimism to keep realistic optimism, realistic <laughs> optimism. Right. Somebody would, said like, you know, you gotta be brutally honest and then optimistic. Well, I, I, I that sounds, it sounds like, I guess I'd never put those words to my own view, but you know, I've always said you have to confront reality the way it is. Exactly. And, and then, and then do everything you can to make the best of the situation. And right now, I mean, I think, you know, our big challenge is, I feel like working with um, the private sector in particular is knowing that we want to ease the economy back up safely as quickly as is, is reasonable to do, but then also be prepared for what could happen in the fall or winter if there's another outbreak. And that's the part that I feel uh, it's hardest for everybody to wrap their heads around. Yeah, certain- I should mention that we have joined the CEO of, of Burton, um, John Lacey has join the governor's back to work group because like I said we have a lot of locations that are ahead of us uh, timing wise and I think you know we can learn from you know from the state on what they're doing uh, and I think they can also learn what we're doing for example in retail in Europe or retail in China for yeah no, that's great. I mean, it's truly importing some of the best uh, practices from overseas, and I think Burton's one of the 
prime examples of companies that have the ability to bring that expertise back to the Vermont context and benefit uh, all of us more broadly. So we've got time for one more question. I'm just curious, you know, you've, you've now weathered nine weeks of this uh, or more, and I'm curious, you know, you've talked about the shift to do uh, shields and masks, which obviously is uh, both personal to you and then broadly beneficial to the public. Any, any particular moments where you've seen the kind of Burton crew perform in a way that, that really stood out uh, as kind of a, I don't know if above and beyond is the right way of putting it, but something that will typify what you feel about the Burton staff um, at a, in a very difficult time. You know, Tim, I try to remind my employees worldwide, we have about a thousand people worldwide every couple of weeks, that what they are doing as individuals is making a huge difference. I mean, honestly, if you had asked me a year ago with the world basically voluntarily shut down in economically in order to save one to two percent of the population, I would say no way. Um, so I try to remind people, and I think, you know, here in Vermont, we've been particularly good. We have the lowest transmission rate, I think, of any state. And that's really, so I try to remind them that what, what they are doing is really important. And then we used our athletes, our world famous athletes around the world to give the same message to our burden community, our snowboard community that you should stay home. And then we're doing things like providing content of, hey, what are our athletes doing to, to stay in shape at home? Or, you know, let's, let's all watch an old snowboard movie online together or something, you know? So we're finding different ways to stay together as a community, but I've been really proud of the way people have really taken this, this stay at home, not for yourself. We have, you know, in general, we have a young, healthy population. They understand that it's not about them, that it's about their grandparents or the people in the office who just got done chemotherapy or, you know, so I, I'm proud of that. And that gives me, hope for the future on addressing things like climate change that hey maybe we can come together as a global uh community and not deny mother nature but address her together yeah i think maybe the selflessness of what people have been willing to do in the last two months has a lot of applications if we continue to rem remember what it's been like to be selfless and think about our actions. Yeah, and we've, they... tried, we've tried to encourage our employees to say, hey, give us input on this and we're gonna change the way we do work after we come out of this. I think the gender roles, you know, the, the burdens people have had to take on domestically. Uh, you know, I said we were talking about Japan. Japan is probably the worst. You know, women with kids don't really work. Uh, and men staying home are all of a sudden realizing how much work goes into managing a home and a family, and they're having to take more responsibilities. And, you know, we're, have, we're more tolerant now. You know, I'll have a Zoom call where a kid will come running in, screaming, crying, and we're, more, we're going to be more tolerant as a society of people's work-life balance needs, and I think that'll all be good. Well, I certainly hope so, and I hope a lot of the best best lessons we've learned um, stay with us. So Donna Carpenter, thank you so much for sharing a bit of the Burton story of how you've managed to get through this, and I hope you'll certainly thank all the people who've been directly involved in um, the shift you made to uh, supply some of our most you know prominent medical facilities who needed the needed the resources bad um, to help. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you for your work. Like I said, I've been impressed uh, with the state and proud to be a Vermonter. Well, it's been a good time for all of us to band together, that's for sure. So for all of you watching, this was Donna Carpenter uh, from Burton talking about the experience that they've had 
uh, weathering this storm and hopefully being stronger coming out of it and heard a lot of really great insights about one of our best workplaces in terms well they're one of our best workplaces for a lot of reasons but um, the role they've helped play both for the state of Vermont and some of our neighboring states has really been uh, absolutely critical so hope you'll join me again tomorrow and I hope you continue to take actions and stay safe thanks a lot